Hello Booktube. This is my second attempt at this video. I did a 55 minute version just now and I didn't show up, never showed up in my f folder on my Chromebook. I don't know what's going on. Maybe if I find it, I'll, I'll do it. Otherwise, it's going to be a very truncated version. This is the second in a version, in, uh, in a series um, of, the, of the books I've read more times than any other book. And there's only three of them as far as I know. I may be able to think of some others later. But this one, just like the first one I talked about earlier, which is called The Invention of Morel, is because... Um, I'm using it to study Spanish. Now, this book was originally written in English, of course. You know the book I'm talking about. If you read the title, it is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. I had uh, read it when I was young. And uh, last year when I was looking for stuff to read for, to, for Spanish learning, I saw a really cheap version of the audiobook on Audible for like a couple bucks and of the Spanish version and the same Spanish translation in an ebook for a couple bucks so like for like I don't know under eight bucks I think I bought those and I've been reading it and listening along in Spanish probably around 20 times I also read the book in English again before I started doing that a couple months ago uh, just to re-familiarize myself with the story and since it's SF there's probably, I assume there'd be a lot of words, um, words that Dick uses that he made up himself that wouldn't be in standard Spanish-English translation dictionaries, um, which, and there are a few, uh, there's a few interesting things like that in the book. It's a, it's a good book. It you may have heard there's a movie called Blade Runner which is based on this book sort of I'm not a fan of that movie uh, there's an interesting video though before I forget by Stephen Andrews at Outlaw Bookseller if you're interested in why the book is called why the movie is called Blade Runner obviously the the title of the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is pretty long for a Hollywood movie but the, the movie but the term Blade Runner makes no sense. It's never used in the book. It's never used in the movie. But there's a really interesting video about how that came about uh, at Outlaw Bookseller. I knew part of the story. I knew it was based on a treatment by uh, another writer. I won't even go into the details. But then I didn't know that that movie treatment was in itself inspired by a book. So there's actually three uh, authors involved in that. So check out that video if you're interested in Blade Runner. When I saw that movie, I had read the book. I had read all of Dick before that movie came out. And I know I'm in the minority here. So this is my minority report. I wish I should cut that out. Um, because my image of... I have a certain idea of what Philip K. Dick what it meant to me. And the the movie is so stylish and so neo noir, and I felt like they were trying to do it. They were trying to do Raymond Chandler in the future. They were trying to do Philip K. Dick. And I'll tell you why I'm probably wrong about this in a minute. But I, when I think of a Philip K. Dick story, and This is very true of his characters, but also his settings, because he was a, very famously a California writer, and he wrote about California, he wrote about the Bay Area, and he wrote about Los Angeles. And the, the, the movie that most comes close, and other people have said this too, comes closest to portraying the future as I read it in his novels is Scanner Darkly. Uh, the Keanu Reeves movie, um, rotoscoped animation movie, you know, where it basically looks like modern times. You know, there's like there's a crappy suburb, lower middle class suburb where you can just picture walking down the street and seeing lawns, overgrown lawns, with like rusty bicycle or deflated basketball in the yard or <coughs> that kind of thing. 
you know, and have this cool like leather jackets and you know ray guns and, and all this stuff. Um, however, Philip K. Dick himself saw footage of the Ridley Scott movie before he passed away, before Dick passed away, and he loved it. I doubt I can find this interview now, but there's an audio interview where he talks about seeing that, and he thought it was amazing looking. He didn't see the final movie, so we don't know what he would have thought about the changes to the story or anything, and he'd never really had a movie adaption before that. Anyway, so I'm probably wrong. It's, it's fine. I'm glad people like it. Uh, the book has so many more layers than the movie, though, and there's so much stuff they left out that I'm like, how is that even the... You know, the main theme, I think, of the people think of... Uh, Blade Runner, Andrews, or Androids, or the main thing I think people get from Philip K. Dick these days is what's human, what's not human, what's real, what's only apparently real, as the um, book by Paul Williams about Philip K. Dick's work and life is called. What's hallucination? What are we imagining? How do we tell the difference? And that, I guess, is the main thing, you know, what what's... What people carry from into the away from Blade Runner is the Void Camp test, test for uh, to to tell if someone is human or or an android, artificial life form, and that's pretty consistent with with the between the book and the movie. That's the most consistent thing in terms of the character of Rick Deckard, Han Solo's character. Um, Harrison Ford's character, you know, Harrison Ford's this, like, you know, cool guy, takes no crap, you know, no emotions, kind of just cyn cynical, uh, private detective type guy in the movie, typical movie hero guy, whereas Rick Deckard in the book is a typical Philip K. Dick hero, which is a guy with a crappy job and a semi unsatisfying marriage and normal workaday problems and it's very different kind of kind of people than that you find in Philip K Dick novels than you find in genre uh, action movies which I th would categorize Blade Runner as with like a little dusting of uh, philosophy on it it's a very strange novel it's not my it wasn't my favorite when I was younger. Probably my favorites were Ubik, uh, Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, and the later ones I liked a lot, Scanner Darkly, Vallis, uh, Transmigration of Timothy uh, Archer. Is that what it's called? I think so. Which I believe was his last f completed novel, Divine Invasion. And... But probably Three Stigmata, I think, is the most, is like the one that for me really defines Philip K. Dick's work. Ubik, I used to like quite a bit. I read that recently too because I was thinking about doing this 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 thing with a Spanish version of Ubik instead. I didn't, it didn't mean as much to me, Ubik, I didn't mean as much to me as this time when I read it as it did when I was young. Which is a reason, the reason I bring that up is because that's a reason I don't like to read, reread a lot of stuff because sometimes I find out I don't like it as much as I used to. But, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep it does have more of a conventional genre book plot because Rick Deckard, like in the movie, is... A bounty hunter. I mean, he works in the book. He actually works for the police department. He's a regular policeman, but he also gets extra work on the side to kill these androids who are escaping to Earth. Androids are allowed to uh, exist on the colonies, the other planets like the Mars colony and stuff that they have, and they're they're basically well, they are just slaves. They're just created to be servants of people. They're not allowed on Earth because the government uh, doesn't want to give people on Earth anything 
because they're trying to get people to emigrate off Earth. This novel is set after World War Three, but it's not a, a, a pure conventional apocalypse, post-apocalypse novel because you know there was no clear winner in the war I mean Russia still exists there's like liaisons between Rick, Rick Deckard and a Russian bounty hunter and the cities still exist they're in San Francisco they go up to Seattle they've got flying cars stuff that people in the 60s thought would be we'd be having um, so there's this there's this there's this war that had you know with this certain kind of dust pulverizing dust kind of bomb that really destroyed the environment killed off most of the animals although there are still trees and things it seems like so for, so what people are really obsessed with in this novel are animals owning animals hence the title do androids dream of electric sheep do androids have the same kind of dreams of what the humans do of like recreating nature and Rick Deckard and he has a wife in the in the in the book. She's very depressed. This is see see there's a there's a there's an abstract cover here. I guess you can't see because of that. You could see anyway. It's in Spanish anyway. But there's a sheep on a tower. They live in this crappy. Uh, this giant tower block in San Francisco in a very depopulated United States of America. They can't immigrate because of his job. He can only make really good money by killing androids and and they're only illegal on Earth so he can't immigrate because he wouldn't have a job. The government wants everybody to immigrate off, off Earth. There's another character named John Isidore which, who probably about a third of the chapters are or from the point of view of John Isidore, who's called in the English version a chicken head. He's got low IQ, so he's not allowed to emigrate either, and he becomes involved with the uh, renegade androids as well. And what it's about, it's a book really about, I think, about cruelty. Because there's, of course, the Void Camp test, which Rick Deckard uses to, uh, you know, ask a certain number of questions of, of a person or of a suspect to determine whether they're an android or not. And the, the androids are basically portrayed as sociopaths. They don't have empathy. But there's a big empathy deficit on everybody's part in this, in this book. There's just extremely cruel I, like, people are punishing each other because they have to live in this post-apocalyptic world it seems like there's uh, John Isidore works uh, as, as repairing mechanical animals because they're for people who can't afford to have their own status symbol of a real animal like Rick Deckard's neighbor who owns a horse they buy mechanical uh, animals Rick and his wife Iran have a electric sheep, I mean, uh, android sheep. It's not literally electric, I don't think. You know, it looks like a real sheep. They pretend to feed it and all this stuff. And he really wants this money from these androids. He's going to go out. There's these six androids that have been, that he's going to try and eliminate. Blade Run, I guess. I don't know why. It's just a cool sounding word, I guess. But, he, you know, it's not really part of the book at all. He's just bounty hunter. And I think this, they get a thousand dollars a piece or something for each one he kills, and he's going to try and go, which would tie the record for the most done in a day if he can get it done. And he wants the money so that he can buy a real live animal because his wife is so depressed, and he thinks this will make their lives better if they buy like a real goat or something. And everybody's obsessed with these animals on Earth. It's really what they're living for is the idea of owning a real animal and I don't even think that plays into it hardly in 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 the movie but you know he even carries like the guide the uh, I forget what the name of the guide is but you know it's got the price guide all there like to see what animals cost and you know if there's an animal that would cost a certain amount but it's thought to be extinct there's an asterisk by it 
this uh, a lot of the a lot of the book is devoted to that. And John Isidore, um, he lives in this this mostly abandoned uh, building in Oakland, where some of the androids move into to hide out. Later, he becomes involved with them in a different way than Rick Deckard was, and they kind of. Uh, they they pretty much take advantage of him. Androids are not portrayed sympathetically. They do horrible things, and especially near the end where they're just pulling about, pulling the spider apart for just to see what will happen to the you know really traumatizing John Isidore because he doesn't understand uh, why they would do something so cruel and they're just doing it out of like morbid fascination. So they're not great either, and humans are are portrayed as people who would do something as sick as create these androids in the first place to be slave labor on other worlds, you know, imbue them with like uh, human traits. You know, Luba Luft is an opera singer, and you know, and they're trying to live their lives, and they escape, and they escape to Earth where they can be free somehow. There's a lot of plot holes. Rick Deckard, uh, you know, there's always in the history of this franchise, there's always discussion whether he's an android himself. And I wonder at some point if if Philip, Philip K. Dick, I mean, he definitely wants the reader to think that's a possibility, at least early on in the book. And because there is an attempt by this group of androids to convince Rick Deckard that he's an android. Because they've got, for some reason, somehow, in the city of San Francisco, they've managed to set up, the androids have managed to set up their own alternative police department, and they arrest him, and they take him in, they try and convince him he's an android. And I'm wondering, almost if Dick had considered that as, as a way for the novel to go, to have him turn out to be an android, but he decided not to do that. And it's very odd to reconcile uh, the way the, the six escaped androids behave in this book, considering there's also supposed to be this um, uh, this this whole network to, to of, of androids with their own fake police department, and everything to try and protect them. And it doesn't really jive together, but that's kind of a trait of, of Philip K. Dick, which is, depending on how you look at it, uh, either a, a bug or a feature, because his books don't really... He doesn't attempt to answer every question. He leaves a lot of stuff open. His books are really... Th uh, philosophical in in that sense he's not trying to merely entertain he's trying he's trying he's trying to discuss problems that he hasn't worked out himself i think and and maybe are not entirely knowable so the world that they live in 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 this ver this post apocalyptic world is just very inshitified and they go through a lot of struggles, but they're like they're like working person struggles, they're working class struggles, they're they're not action movie struggles. It's really kind of beside the point that he it's true he happens to be a cop and he happens to be engaged in some kind of genre activity like hunting down criminals or quote unquote criminals and shooting guns and stuff which doesn't happen in every dick novel uh, a lot of times the stakes are different but it's really much more in terms of a of for 
uh, of trying to in, trying to make connections with other people. Like John Isidore has probably got kind of a crush on on this one android who's staying in his building, who's a copy of the same android that Rick Deckard is is obsessed with. Rachel Rosen, who first he thinks is not an android, and is told that she is and that she doesn't know she is and and I think it's a and there's this uh, another thing they left out of the movie is this sort of quasi philosophical quasi religion religion that a lot of people practice called mercerism which has to do with this person named Mercer I think it's John Mercer I'm not sure what his first name was who's supposedly stuck like on an asteroid or a satellite or something halfway you know up in orbit being pelted by rocks just being tortured constantly and people are uh, uh, as well as being obsessed with owning creatures they're obsessed with his plight and somehow gives them hope because he's struggling on and then there's another character uh, called uh, I think it's I can't remember the name. It's somebody Buster, uh, amiable, amiable Buster is how it's sort of put in in Spanish. But I think it's a Buddy Buster or something like that. Is the guy's name it was on TV. It was, seems like one of the characters. Maybe he, this this character inspired some of the television stuff in RoboCop because this this guy uh, Buddy Buster is on TV. Like seems like. To John Isidore, who's obsessed with him, watch him all the time. Seems like he's on, has a talk show that's on like eight, ten, twelve hours a day. He's wondering like, wh how, when is this guy ever asleep, or how's he on the air all the time? The same guy, and with the most vapid, stupid uh, talk show where they make fun of people. You know, just the most low common denominator entertainment. Who. Exposes uh, this Mercer cult as being a, a fake. You know, he gets cameras up there, and they show that the, it's actually not an asteroid or whatever it's supposed to be. It's actually just a painted set, and this person is just an actor. And but at least it seems implied to me that that it doesn't really affect people's belief in Mercerism because they need to believe in something because life is so bleak and all they've really got is, is is these sort of for want of a better term like middle class dreams of like I, of wanting to emigrate to another planet where life's supposedly going to be better or to have a status symbol like boy if I could just own a goat if I can, and if, if I could just uh, with my neighbor's uh, horse has a foal if I could just buy the foal and, and I'll then I'll be happy because I'll have some status in society and if I just kill these six androids I'll have uh, $6,000 and then I can buy a goat and, and then my wife won't be depressed and so it's uh, very different kind of stakes and kind of different thought process that go into that than go into the movie and gives you at least gives me more to think about than just uh, what does it mean to be human in the very strict sense of is an artificial human the same as a real human? And I think in a way, if I have to come to a conclusion, I really haven't come to one. It's a very strange novel. Maybe this is, comes from just reading it too many times and overthinking it is... Very, pe very peculiar ideas that sort of mesh together and don't, and really everything's like sort of basically unknowable. Uh, they don't really end up. I think part. I think it's rather deliberate on Dick's uh, part that Rick Deckard goes through all this stuff, doesn't end up any better. You know, you know. Who wins in in the sense of uh, the plot and and his objectives of of killing all these androids and making the record and pleasing his bosses kind of 
and getting the money and then you know gets taken away from him i won't tell you in just a, in a gratuitous act of cruelty uh, so he's back where he started <laughs> you know they don't so their god has been exposed as a fraud doesn't end up with an animal and he thinks he might have a second animal which turns out you know he finds a bullfrog at one point which is the rarest of rarest animals so it's it's not like a hierarchy like uh, you know, there's like sort of mysteries about why certain animals are more rare than others, and and of course, you know, finding out, you know, that this bullfrog is artificial too, and it bookends with his wife Iran, who's kind of come out of her depression a bit, uh, you know, so. He, when Rick Decker does spend all this money on buying a goat, and which doesn't live very long for reasons that, uh, you know, which are directly responsible to, which are a uh, direct response to Rick Decker's behavior towards Rachel Rosen that causes her to take. revenge on him trying to hurt him in the way that she the worst way she could possibly think of which is to kill his goat and then he thinks he's and then he finds out this bulldog he's got is I mean this bullfrog he's got is uh, false and it ends with Iran his wife Iran ordering mechanical flies to feed to the to the mechanical bullfrog um, and she's gonna you know she's starting to she has some affection for the bullfrog they started with an electric sheep they lose that and you know buy a real goat and then gets murdered destroyed by Rachel Rosen and end up with this robot frog and then but it, it does give her some sort of at the end, at least, it gives her something to look forward to, something to take care of in this very, very grim book. So, yeah, I guess that's what I have to say. It's a really good, it's a really interesting book. I'm Like, I'm, like I say, it was probably not my favorite of his books but I'm glad I've got a chance to read it over and over again to think about different things because it is a, it is one that 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 a lot of people uh, resonates with a lot of people because it is that android thing um, that we think about today like what it means to be human and that but I think there's also a lot of different that question of what does it mean to be human is tackled a lot and myriad ways in the book and done on a, a lot of different levels than just the ones that are shown in the movie so I recommend it I think I think I still like it most of those other books better but I probably no I shouldn't say that I was almost said I probably should read some of those again but I don't know if I will because there's so much to read but probably the like the purest Philip K. Dick I think if you want to just get as much of it in one as you can I would recommend a three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge I think that one really really works really well and Vallis which kind of brings it into the uh, just up to, uh, into the straight literary fiction um, realm rather than robots and stuff like that. Yeah, I had a lot more to say before, but um, I hope this one isn't too downbeat because I am pretty pissed off that I lost that other video. It was too long anyway and it went into a bunch of other crap. So, do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? That is my review with spoilers and I haven't been doing as many videos lately because I'm getting ready to move to another town soon. I'm moving to Vlor. For, I'm going to stay there for three months and maybe we'll have some pictures on the way or whatever. And I'm probably going to post my 
finally do my newbie booktube newbie tag soon maybe put that up for March for April 2nd do it on one of the Tuesdays uh, so I'll see you then